My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I bring you warm greetings from the Philippines. It's very warm there. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank Archbishop Lori, the other bishops, and the whole Archdiocese of Baltimore, and the organizers of this Congress for their kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here, and we should thank the Lord for gathering us as one community of faith so that we could be bearers of hope in our society, in our families, in our history, this particular moment of history. I know that this homily serves also as a keynote address. I don't know how to blend the two. <laughs> so I suppose it will sound more like a homily than a keynote address. And then we have workshops and other facilitators who could expound on the theme of the Congress, which is hope, esperanza, hope. Is there anyone here whose name is Hope? None. Esperanza. None. Oh, beautiful words not used anymore as names. No. We use other names, non-biblical. They come from the world of celebrity and everything. <laughs> but the biblical words that could define who I am and my mission. So, at least today, all the women are called hope or esperanza <laughs> today. <laughs> or maybe until Saturday. And all the males, well, Esperanto, I don't know, <laughs> or maybe. For a name is not just a label, it is about identity and mission. Hope. Even in our spoken English, we say there is a difference between wish, wishing, and hoping. I wish that complete the sentence, but you say, I hope in. The psalm says that, happy are they who hope in God. In scriptures and in the tradition of Christianity, hope is a virtue that comes from God. It is grace. We cannot produce hope by ourselves. But it is called a theological virtue because the object of hope is God. Not anything. I don't say at least. If I am in my right mind and spirituality, I don't say and I should not say I hope in money. I should not say, I hope in power. I hope in a businessman. For it to be a theological virtue, it is directed at God. I hope in God. In the same way that faith is focused on God. I believe in God. And the theological virtue of love also is directed at God. Love God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul. And if hope, true hope, is in God, then you live. Pope Francis says, do not rob me of life by robbing me of hope. Those who hope in God find a reason to live. 
And those who hope in God find the energy to live. Sir, am I going too fast? <laughs> no, it's fine. Now, where am I? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Ah, yes. Some people might say, oh, it is difficult to hope in God when life is miserable when we have violence left and right, when we see many people without jobs, without homes, and I guess all of you are saddened by what happened in Florida. Children who go to school, and then what do they get? Violence. So some question hope. because there is so much negativity. But when we look at the scriptures, especially the scriptures, we realize that the theological virtue of hope blooms in the midst of darkness, in absurdity, in obscurity, or what I often call the dilemmas of life. Very often, we don't encounter only problems. What we encounter daily are dilemmas. For problems, we find solutions. But if you are wondering why some of your problems have not been solved, maybe they are not problems. Maybe they are dilemmas. And a dilemma is a problem that does not disappear. And so you do not look for solution to dilemmas. You look for people who's, who have stories of hope. The wives here, may I know who are wives? Yeah. Well, when you look at your husband, what do you see? A problem or a dilemma? <laughs> if he is a problem, find a solution. But if he is a dilemma, you need hope. <laughs> husbands, <laughs> husbands. <laughs> What do you see in your wives? Huh? Priests, what do you see in your bishops? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very often, our stance to the realities of life is problem solving, finding a solution. And for all the genius and the advance in knowledge and technology, problems remain. Maybe it is not so much solutions that we need. We need hope. We need hope so that we could live in the midst of the adversities of life. Abraham. He was told by God, leave your homeland. And he was advanced in age. And then he was promised by God, you will have many descendants. Absurd. He could not even have a son with Sarah. But Abraham believed even what was absurd. He believed not so much in the words, but he believed in the one who made the promise. He hoped in God. And when Isaac was born, God said, okay, sacrifice him. 
If I were Abraham, I would have said, hey, you, you promised me countless uh, descendants, and they would all start with Isaac. And now you want me to sacrifice him. But thank God I am not Abraham. <laughs> Abraham believed in the one who made the promise. And the future happened. The future which was the promise of God. Believing in the one who made the promise. And God will have a future for you. The Blessed Mother, already quite secure in her engagement to Joseph. Again, you will bear a son. I don't have a, I don't have a husband. Don't worry, the Holy Spirit. And she believed. How absurd. She trusted. And she gave birth to the Savior of the world. And the future of humanity has been changed since. So we find in scriptures the context where hope blossoms, hope in God in the midst of distress, where you cannot count on human wisdom, you cannot count on human promises, but we have God. Happy are they who hope in God. This is the life that Moses talks about in the first reading. Before the Israelites, Moses presented the choice, life or death. But where do they find life? They find life if they will be faithful to God. So if there is a profound relationship, covenant relationship with God, hope in God, as they travel through the desert in their suffering, if they hope in God, they are choosing life. But if they disobey God, if they separate themselves from God, if they worship other gods, then they have actually chosen death. So to hope in God is to live. No wonder many people are experiencing death even when they are still physically and biologically alive because they have chosen other gods idols, and they have put their hope in idols, then they don't experience fullness of life. The choice is be before us, life or death. In one confirmation, I explained to the candidates, the young people, that after confirmation, they should show to the world that they have already chosen to live in Christ, life in Christ. And so I gave them a test. I asked them, what is more important, watching a TV show or praying? And they said, praying. I said, wow, there is hope. <laughs> And then I ask them, oh, what will, is your priority? No? Attending to video games or going to the Blessed Sacrament? Going to the Blessed Sacrament. Wow. Wow. And then I ask them, which is more valuable, the Eucharist or three million dollars? Three million dollars. <laughs> Yeah, choosing life, hope in God is quite difficult because that is not what our prevailing cultures teach, especially the young. 
In the gospel, Jesus shows to us how that life is found. He is the example. His hope in God, the God, the Father, who had sent him, enabled him to integrate suffering to his mission. He will be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. But hope in God, on the third day, he will be raised again. And he invites his disciples, if you want to follow me, if you want to come after me, put your hope in God. For me and my sake and the sake of the gospel, are you ready to suffer, to deny yourself? Lose yourself, but you will gain life. But it is life in Jesus. Again, the choice is before us, life or death, hope or despair, false hope. We Christians are asked to make a powerful testimony to the world that even if we are worried concerned, even if we suffer, even if we know we will be rejected or be persecuted, we have a reason to live because we have hope in God. And this is not wishful thinking we can point to Jesus who had experienced it. And without his hope, he would not have carried the cross. He would not have embraced death. But it was the promise of God, the one whom he called Abba, Father, that made him strong. And he shares that life with us. There are many people who are experiencing dilemmas. And we don't need to go far. We ourselves suffer almost daily. But there are people who are suffering more than we do, probably. We think of victims of human trafficking, the victims of human smuggling, of exploitation, especially online exploitation. We have people who have no family to claim them. We have people who are dispersed because of conflicts, wars, that they do not understand, but they are the first victims. Even as we speak, there are 65 million refugees or forced migrants roaming around the world. I have met many of them in my capacity as president of Caritas International. They don't understand the national and international politics that have brought disaster and wars to their streets. The only thing they know is that their houses are bombed and they had to escape for the sake of their families. the forced migrants, the refugees, 
the victims of violence. Children like that 19-year-old boy who lost his parents, adoptive parents, and probably had a lot of despair in his heart expressed in violence. Jesus is asking us, if you wish to come after me, be a bearer of life, show hope, show the power of hope in God, life in God to them. And they will embrace it, for that is what they need. But will we open our eyes, open our hearts? Will we open our hands to journey with them so that it will be a common journey of hope in God? Let me end with some stories. And I promise you, I'm ending now. <laughs> I visited a refugee camp in Greece. That portion of Greece uh, with the border, the border near the border with uh, the ex the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. And, uh, yeah, that day, according to Caritas Greece, that day was quite slow because in one hour, only, only 1,500 refugees came. That hour. So it was a slow day. I said, slow. Uh, they came from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. There was even a family from Sudan. So we helped distribute food, medicine, and it was noticeable that they came only with their clothing, the clothing that they had on, and the most precious to them, their families. And so, unaccompanied minors really would catch your attention because they were walking alone. And there was one boy, a teenage boy. I interviewed him. I said, where are you from? And he understood some English. And he said, Syria, Syria, Syria. I said, your parents, where are they? He said, in Syria. He said, why are you alone? Why are they in Syria? And he said, parents said, go, go. When, when I think of him, I ask myself, where is he now? Will he meet his parents again? Will they be reunited? Are his parents still alive? And after the distribution of, of food, I went to the tent where they were held before they were allowed to cross the border. And I saw him again. And I asked him, the same questions, and then he, it was his turn to ask me, are you a Muslim? I said, no, I am a Christian. And then he, said, she, he asked, why do you take care of us? Why are you showing this caring, this love for us? 
his question opened the space for us to name. Jesus taught us to love everyone. And we know, we know that action of feeding, of warmth, gave him a taste of hope. That there must be some, some mystery that cares for us and that makes us walk to life. And when it was time to leave the camp, I, I did not know where the exit was. As I was going around talking with people, and then I said, oh wow, I might get left behind. So I asked people, I said, uh, I said where, where is the exit to the parking area? And, and the person said, oh, you're, you're standing right at the exit. And, he pointed to a sign. See, that sign. Of course, you're in Greece. So it was in Greek. <laughs> and for the first time in my life, I thanked my Greek professor. <laughs> my professor in biblical Greek. Because I saw the sign. It said, Ex Odos. Exodus the way out. And I said, oh wow, I'm standing beneath this sign. So I sent a text message to the Secretary General of Caritas, who was in Rome at that time. I said, Michelle, you would not believe this. I am standing in this camp beneath the sign that says, Exodus. And he responded, then God must be there. God must be there, journeying with them. I said, yes, God is here. And finally, I was in a summer camp for you, the youth. You know, every, I'm sure it happens here during summer. You have some activities for the young people. So that particular year, a camp focused on discovering one's purpose in life. It was really a vocation campaign. But we did not want to call it vocation camp. <laughs> Nobody might come. So, so discovering the purpose of life, etc. So we got thousands of them. <laughs> so I gave a short talk about, you know, it was more of a sharing. And then we opened the floor to questions. The first question that I got was from a young girl. And this was the question. Bishop, will you sing for us? And I said, nobody told me to, that I would be required to sing. I said, please ask sensible questions <laughs> related to the topic, uh, related to the topic of the, of, the, uh, of the Congress, you know. So serious questions came. Then one young boy raised his hand and asked, so Bishop, Will you sing for us? <laughs> so I said, okay, we will sing together. I will start uh, singing uh, a popular song, then join me. And so with the song finished, you know, in good Filipino tradition, the young people f uh, flocked to the uh, stage. Uh, they asked for blessing, you know, like that, or... Uh, they asked for selfies, uh, <laughs> photos. You know. Some asked for autographs on their Bibles, their notebooks, and some asked for autographs on their shirts. 
No, here. One girl even said, here, I want it here. I said, no, 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 no. Uh, turn around. Turn around. Uh, people will wonder, hey, how, how did the signature of the, of the bishop land? I said, no, no, turn around. Here, the, the sleeves. And but as this was going on, this circus was going on, I was... Uh, I was asking myself, what's happening here? What, uh, what do they see in me? Do they see a bishop? Am I carrying myself like a bishop? Or am I a movie star? Or <laughs> what am I? <laughs> Why are they asking me to sing and all of these things? No. Why are they asking for autographs? And... But I just let it go. The answer came a year later. In a similar summer camp, one boy approached me and said, last year, Bishop, you signed, you, you autographed my shirt. I said, ah, oh, yes, yes, I remember that. He said, I have not washed it since. <laughs> I said, yee, one year, <laughs> one year. Then he said, but every night I fold it, I put it under my pillow. I have not seen my father in years. But with that t-shirt, with your signature, I know I belong to a family. And I know I have a father in the priests. In the darkness, there is a reason to live if hope in God is manifested. It could be through food shared, or even through an autograph on a t-shirt. Jesus invites us, if you want to follow me, then for God, in God, share life, share life. Let us pause for a reflection on the readings and the beautiful theme of hoping in God so that there might be life and light in the world.